My name is John Stase. Um, I'm going to present our work uh, about static uh, detection of second order vulnerabilities in web applications, a research topic uh, covered by Torsten Holtz and myself uh, at the beginning of the year. And before we jump into uh, our implementation details and how we want to detect those vulnerabilities statically with static code analysis, uh, we are explaining what second order vulnerabilities are. So most of you probably know what first order vulnerabilities are, and these are the vulnerabilities where a lot of research is put on. Uh, so for example, SQL injections, um, they follow the same concept. Uh, as, as all other first order vulnerabilities. So we always have some user input that is embedded into some markup. Uh, here it's a SQL query, and then uh, it ends in a sensitive sync, the SQL, uh, the MySQL query function. Um, and then the, f the application chokes on this specially crafted input, you can say, like it, it causes some harm. Um, so the attacker sends this payload, and in the first step, in the first order, the application uh, does something malicious then. In order to prevent that, uh, developers um, get a bit more aware. They apply sanitization. So in this example, we apply escaping. We cannot break out of the SQL query anymore because we escaped the single quotes. Um, and then the application is safe against SQL injection. But this is usually the point where the developer stops thinking, uh, thinking <laughs> uh, because um, yeah, we have no SQL injection anymore, but it is important to note uh, for this particular code snippet that the payload is not really diffused. It is still uh, reachable for the application because what it does, it stores the payload into a database. So we have a, an insert query, as you can see, and it stores the supplied username into the, uh, into the, data, uh, into the table users. Another problem is if the application reads this payload again from the database on a later point, um, then uh, it can cause uh, harm again in the second order. Um, for example, here we have a persistent cross-site scripting vulnerability because the username is read from the table and is um, outputted um, to the user again. So this is the, the general concept of second order vulnerabilities. We also want to introduce what uh, multi-step exploits are. Multi-step exploits, uh, so that's the name how we call them, are like a subcategory of second order vulnerabilities. And here um, we use a first order vulnerability um, to, 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 to uh, spread our payload more. So in a second order vulnerability, the first step is always to write your pay payload somewhere, and this can be by application design. Uh, and in a multi-step exploit, you use a first order vulnerability uh, to uh, yeah, escalate that a bit more. So we, if we have a SQL injection here, uh, we can not only taint the column username, but only also the second uh, column of this query, namely the password column, uh, and any up following columns uh, in the SQL query. So the attacker now sends his payload, um, exploited the SQL injection, and could spread his payload into the database. And if, it's, if the application on the later point reads from one of those columns, uh, specifically if the developer uh, assumes that in this column is, can only be static contact or a hash password, which can usually not cause any damage, um, then we have a, another critical vulnerability. So that's the concept how it works. We, also have, uh, we always have user input. It is stored in some persistent data store that cannot be only databases. We also focus on uh, files. Uh, file names, uh, um, to be more precise, uh, or the session data the application uses, which is by default uh, file content. Um, and then the payload uh, continues flowing from this persistent data store uh, in, the, in the second step into a sensitive operation of the application. So we saw a username getting posted, stored in the database, and echoed back, and then we had a second order cross-head scripting, also called persistent cross-head scripting vulnerability. Okay, um, we want to take these vulnerabilities statically with static code analysis. Uh, the problem here is that we don't have access to our environment. We do static code analysis, that means we only analyze the source code of the application, and um, we have to find a way to, to still recognize this data flow through some external devices. And what we do is we analyze the reads and writes of the application. Um, 
we, I will show that in, in, in a second. Uh, and then at the end of our analysis, we can connect those input and output points uh, and can decide if a vulnerability occurs or not. So we developed a prototype. We focus on the PHP language. Uh, it's the most popular um, scripting language on the web. And um, yeah, we want to take some source code, throw it into our prototype, uh, and in the end, have some second order vulnerability reports. Okay, um, this is the concept how our first order taint analysis works. Uh, we introduced our prototype uh, at the beginning of this year at the NDSS conference, uh, and I'm briefly going into how we usually detect first order vulnerabilities and then what we added to detect second order vulnerabilities. So we take the source code, um, uh, construct a control flow graph uh, consisting out of basic blocks, um, and whenever in a basic block we analyze, if we find a sensitive sync, we analyze the sensitive sync for uh, potential user input that could flow into the sensitive sync. So namely here we found a SQL um, function that executes a SQL query, and then uh, we analyze um, the variables used or the, the arguments used in this function. So we trace them backwards to our basic blocks. And by doing that, we use uh, a data symbol. We call a data symbol, it's the delta you can see on the slide. Um, it is just an abstract way of the, the data we are trying to resolve. And to this data symbol, we attach some text so we know about the sanitization status, the encoding status, and what have you. And once we, we found that uh, we found user input, uh, the, the, the argument could be resolved to user input, we issue a vulnerability report. So that is the typical way how you uh, implement taint analysis for, uh, for vulnerability detection. So what we do now, if, if we find escaping, then our first prototype would actually say, okay, we have no SQL injection vulnerability and nothing would happen. The new prototype, however, uh, also analyzes uh, if, he, if he's aware that he's analyzing a SQL uh, execution, um, then he analyzes the SQL query and he would detect, okay, this is an insert query, so there's some writing of data going on, and he would analyze and find out the injection point, uh, which is the first, um, uh, the second column here, it's, it's um, the, the username again. Um, and then in our analy um, analyzer environment, we have a virtual table where we store the data symbol we found, uh, which means we store this source that we found. Um, so we can use this later on to dis not only decide if this, uh, if this column was actually taintable, but also we still know which data it was. The same for multi-step exploit. Um, if we find a SQL injection, we issue a SQL injection vulnerability report, but we don't stop here. Um, we also assume then that by the SQL injection in this insert query, you can taint the columns of this table. But only the columns, of course, uh, which are in the field list after inject the injection happens. So as you can see here in the bottom, in the little table, uh, we stored here the, the data symbols and we save that, that, um, that we could taint these, these columns. Okay, that was the first step. We have to analyze the writings of the application. And now we analyze um, the readings of the application. This is the second step. So again, we just normally analyze our source code for application uh, for vulnerabilities. And if you find a sensitive sync and trace, and, and while we resolve the argument, uh, if we encounter that the data is not coming from user input or is not static, but is coming from a persistent data store, uh, then we issue a temporary vulnerability report. Again, connected to the data symbol, uh, which save which saves from this which uh, persistent data store uh, the, the data is coming from, and of course the vulnerability type. So in the in the end, we find ourselves having lots of temporary vulnerability report um, if we were successful, and we have what you can see on the right side uh, a list of taintable persistent data stores. And now we can connect these input and output points, um, and we can see do we actually have uh, second order vulnerability, so we can check is the uh, column name of the table users, is it, ta is it taintable, and is the data symbol not sanitized against the uh, vulnerability uh, type that occurred, and um, then we can issue a second order vulnerability report. Uh, 
we evaluated our approach against um, different types of applications. Uh, the first three are real-world applications. Um, we, we chose uh, OS Commerce and two, um, which is an e-commerce so uh, software, and uh, uh, Hot CRP and OpenConf, which are two academic, uh, well, well-known uh, software and ac academia uh, conference management systems. And we also choose three toy applications that are largely used in previous work. So we wanted to compare our results against previous work. Uh, then, we, in the first, then we divided our evaluation in two steps because our prototype does two steps as well. And we first wanted to find out how many persistent data stores are used by those applications or by the applications we, we chose. Um, and are they really taintable or not taintable? Taintable for us means we can inject certain markup characters uh, that are needed for exploitation. For example, the single quotes or double quotes or whatever. And we found that 77% of, uh, of the data stores are actually not taintable. So for example, uh, if you have a column of type integer, you cannot taint this column. Uh, or if it's sanitized by the application, uh, if only static contact is written to that column, then it's not taintable as well. But 23% uh, of those persistent data stores were taintable just by the concept of the, uh, of the, the application. Um, so then we wanted to find out how good is our prototype? Does it detect these 23% of taintable persistent data stores? And our prototype detected 71% uh, correctly, flagged them as taintable, and uh, we also had um, twenty nine percent false negatives, um, which is the reason for that is mostly uh, because we have to analyze for example SQL queries, but if the SQL query is um, constructed in a really complicated way with loops and uh, for example then it 's really difficult to reconstruct those SQL queries with static code analysis, and then we would miss writings to these uh, columns, for example, and we also had a six percent uh, false positives. Um, I'll come to that in the next slide. So we added then, after we found out uh, about the, the first step, we added the second step, the actual vulnerability detection, and uh, we found 159 uh, new uh, vulnerabilities, uh, which were uh, missed by previous work, and 97% of these new vulnerabilities are um, persistent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Um, because in Azure, uh, in an application, of course, very often, um, the databases are the most common um, persistent data source we could see, so this was the most common vulnerability. But we also had some interesting vulnerabilities I will introduce shortly. Um, yeah, we had a false discovery rate of 21%. Um, the root cause was because our prototype uh, does not support uh, past-sensitive sanitization, so for example, if only valid email addresses uh, can be stored in, in the database and um, only then the specific pass is taken if the email is valid and then we did not detect that. Um, and of course, if you do failures in the first step, they will propagate into the second step. But still, we found, uh, uh, we found uh, the, the false positive rate acceptable. Um, we also uh, evaluated, evaluated our multi-step exploit report. Uh, here we found 14 uh, true positives, and they're mainly based on SQL injections where you could uh, escalate uh, to, to taint more columns or you could uh, return more data in a select query. Um, and those multi-step exploits were also missed in previous work. We also had a false positive. Of course, if you flag wrongly a SQL injection, uh, then our prototype assumes uh, more columns to be taint taintable uh, than actually are. So let's have a look at an example. Um, this is an example of OpenConf. Um, so what OpenConf does, it has a, t a table configuration, and in this configuration table, it stores its settings, and also at the beginning of each, um, of each request, it calls the print header function that basically includes a header file. And this header file is coming from the database of this uh, configuration table. And our prototype, um, yeah, well, the first step is not really a vulnerability itself. Uh, our prototype uh, detected that these settings can be arbitrarily changed by an administrator. So if you 
supply an OC header file as uh, as a uh, as a as a setting you want to change, and you you then can um, specify any arbitrary file you want to include, so you can change this this setting. So our is uh, our prototype issued a second order file inclusion vulnerability. Now interestingly, it also uh, issued some multi-step exploits connected to this second order vulnerability. Um, because that was because our prototype found a file upload feature or vulnerability that is hard to decide, and um, also some SQL injection and cross scripting vulnerabilities. So if you connected all those vulnerabilities, our prototype found that you could, that you can actually, as a normal user, upload a file, uh, for example, your paper you're submitting to the conference, but also you um, inject your PHP payload in this PDF file. If you then escalate your privileges to administrator, by abusing a SQL injection or cross site scripting vulnerability, you could use the second order file inclusion vulnerability uh, to, uh, point, to point the header file to, the, to your uploaded paper, which would end in uh, including your paper at each request of the application. And because you injected your PHP payload into your, your, your paper, um, you would have a remote command execution vulnerability. So this example actually showed um, how complicated vulnerabilities can be and um, how important it is to, to detect them. Um, yeah. Okay, to conclude, uh, we showed that the uh, static detection of second order vulnerabilities is possible. Uh, we don't have access to, to the persistent data stores, we don't have access to the, this environment, but still we can collect the reads and writes and then connect these input and output points uh, to detect if we have second order vulnerabilities or not. Um, we found over 150 new vulnerabilities that were missed in previous work, and um, in the end we had remote command execution in usepro, scarf, openconf, and OS commerce. Um, so we, we believe that this is an overlooked problem in practice and uh, needs improvement. So future work uh, that is open is to support prepared statements. We are working on that. Uh, and also to improve our SQL parser because we don't, our SQL parser is yet quite basic, but if it's uh, having really, um, really complicated SQL queries with a lot of subselects and SQL features, uh, then it uh, might have problems. Yeah, once again, we want to thank uh, Facebook for the, for the big award, and it will definitely help to improve our prototype and to um, yeah, improve the development process of this prototype. Um, that's it. Thank you for your attention, and um, I'm happy to ask uh, to answer any questions. So we have time for a few questions. Yes, Ben. Uh, ben Lifshitz, MSR. So we've had about 10 years of papers now on finding vulnerabilities in PHP code. Now, I'd argue that you know, any system of sufficient size in PHP will probably have a handful of vulnerabilities at least. So I wonder if you have any uh, lessons here for systems that are written in higher order languages, maybe Java or some such. What are your thoughts on that? Um, thank you for the question. Um, difficult to say. I, I, I would say that PHP indeed is a problem uh, for those vulnerabilities. Um, I do see in, in Applications in other languages, by default, being more secure. Uh, however, uh, it is still possible to develop uh, safe PHP applications, so uh, I wouldn't just for the security change the, the language. I could not recommend any language better than PHP. It also de like always depends on what you want to do. So, um, yeah. Um, Marathi University of Tokyo. So, um, how do you think, what do you think about cleaning fixed point actually theorem and that it's impossible to statically analyze uh, island grammars inside of one language because, well, practically speaking, you can't write a parser of uh, SQL unless you execute it dynamically. That's the problem. And the second problem is since it's second order of vulnerability, so you have to converge actually two different semantics of, say, cross-scripting is a HTML semantics, right? And then uh, 
SQL injection, SQL semantics, and then find intersection of these uh, two semantics, which is theoretically not possible. And second question is, uh, what is uh, uh, like the most found uh, SQL injection vulnerability of second order that I, I find myself in personal work is actually error-based process scripting. Like when you launch SQL, uh, SQL server complains that okay, it's invalid SQL, and writes SQL itself, and which produces cross scripting. So mm -hmm. I assume that your uh, tool doesn't detect this kind of vulnerabilities unless they're stored, right? Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, to the second question, uh, we does have that too. A lot of vulnerability reports uh, are, if I, if I, I think that's what, what you meant, uh, like uh, reports where a SQL query could go wrong and if that is the case, then the SQL query is printed back to the user as an error message. And you have a lot of uh, well, false positive reports because in the usual case, um, the SQL query would not fail. And only if it fails, then you would have a cross-scripting vulnerability. But the cross-scripting vulnerability is not as interesting because you would already have a SQL injection to break the query. If I understood you correctly, that was yeah. the problem you encountered. Uh, we had that too. Um, what we did is we, we flag functions that are wrappers for, uh, for those uh, SQL queries. Um, so in large applications, you don't, um, you don't execute a SQL query just directly with MySQL query. You have a wrapper function. And if we detect such a wrapper function, um, then we disable cross-scripting reports for this wrapper function. So we don't have the problem that then this SQL wrapper function uh, issues cross scripting vulnerabilities, which are not of our interest because uh, you can change that with a debug level if you want to have those reports or not. And yeah, then you would have to argue if it's a true positive or false positive. Thanks. And the first question, uh, you have to repeat again, sorry. It's just click clean a fixed point theorem. What do you think about it and how you want to approach it anyhow? What do you mean by that? You know, it's proven mathematically that it's impossible to parse statically languages for... Uh, okay, like yeah, well, uh, of course, uh, we also have the problem in the whole in this static code analysis. We, we cannot get, we cannot have, um, yeah, like 100% true positives and 0% false positives. Uh, we, we are struggling with the halting problem. Um, so, and reconstructing all strings and applications is really difficult. We, we do our best to, to, have, uh, to have the best trade-off and using static code analysis as a tool to find them. Uh, still, of course, you, you will get false positives uh, no matter what. If, if we pa uh, fix past sensitive sanitization, we will still have false positives because we are using static code analysis. Um, yeah. okay. It's an interesting discussion, but maybe take them offline. Okay, so that, that concludes the session. I want to thank Johannes again, our speakers. Thank you.